my fellow Americans. Not long ago, I received a letter from a woman in the Midwest. She wrote, Dear Mr. President, in my humble way, I am writing to you about the crisis in Vietnam. I have a son who is now in Vietnam. My husband served in World War II. Our country was at war. But now, this time, it's just something that I don't understand. Why? Why Vietnam? Munich, 1938. German Chancellor Adolf Hitler arrives for a conference to be held here with British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. This meeting will long be remembered, for it opens the door to the dreams of dictatorship in our time. a shortcut to disaster. But even then, this was no new lesson. It had stared us in the face with Mussolini in Ethiopia. Ethiopia's emperor, Haile Selassie, made his protest to the League of Nations, but nothing was done. We'd also seen the Anschluss in Austria, and nothing was done. Then in 1950, aggression was again unleashed, this time across the 38th parallel in Korea. But free men had begun to learn the lesson, and something was done. The lesson had been learned. And President Johnson had phrased its meaning well. Aggression unchallenged is aggression unleashed. Why must young Americans, born into a land exultant with hope and with golden promise, toil and suffer and sometimes die in such a remote and distant place? The answer, like the war itself, is not an easy one. But it echoes clearly from the painful lessons of half a century. Three times in my lifetime, in two world wars and in Korea, Americans have gone to far lands to fight for freedom. We have learned at a terrible and a brutal cost that retreat does not bring safety and weakness does not bring peace. And it is this lesson that has brought us to Vietnam. For the background to our involvement in Vietnam, we must go back to a shell-cratered place called Dien Bien Phu. Supplied only by air, completely surrounded by the opposing Vietnamese, French troops are fighting the last battle of a long war over what had been called French Indochina. It's a strange three-cornered struggle. Non-communist Vietnamese fighting communist Vietnamese, and some of both fighting the French. By 1954, the inevitability of French defeat has become clear. Hanoi, in 1954, reflects the ravages of long and bitter warfare. But for now, the fighting is over. The French are leaving. The Red Star flies over Hanoi as the communist forces move in. At a conference in Geneva, an agreement has been reached. It divides Vietnam into north and south, turns over the north to the communists, 
and marks the end of French colonial rule. The agreement also provides the machinery for bringing true peace to Vietnam if the communists act in good faith. This is a bright victory for the communist world and there are smiles. But not on the faces of the more than one million Vietnamese who desert their homes and flee southward rather than live under a communist regime. From then to now, the basic story of United States help to Vietnam is simple. The communists have steadily increased their pressure on South Vietnam. South Vietnam has asked for greater support to resist that pressure and has received it. So increasing communist aggression has called forth increases in the scope of United States counteraction. But United States policy has remained the same. We are committed to helping a free people defend their sovereignty. Let us trace the history of that commitment. In 1954, Vietnam is divided at the 17th parallel, as Korea was divided at the 38th. She faces the future with an imaginary line running from border to border, symbolizing a separation which is far from imaginary. In the north, Ho Chi Minh, communist leader of North Vietnam, plays the kindly, smiling grandfather. But behind the smile is a mind which is planning a reign of terror in South Vietnam, in which children and adults alike will be the victims. In South Vietnam, peace brings a fresh beginning. The people set about building new homes, new hopes. Free elections are held in the South alone when it becomes clear that the communist regime in the North has no intention of permitting genuinely free elections in its half of the country. Also in 1954, President Eisenhower pledges economic aid to assist the government of Vietnam in developing and maintaining a strong, viable state capable of resisting attempted subversion and aggression through military means. Land reforms redistribute farmlands in the South so that farmers own their fields and reap for themselves the fruit of their toil. With American economic aid, the South begins to prosper and the hopes of the people are for peace. These hopes, shared by so many in Southeast Asia, are reinforced in Manila when in 1955, the United States and others sign the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty, forming CETO and guaranteeing the mutual security of Southeast Asia from armed aggression. But even as the people of the South build, North Vietnam is creating in their villages political action centers with trained agitators infiltrated from the North, often in the guise of refugees. The communist plan also includes acts of terror and subversion to disrupt the legitimate government. If the South cannot be brought under Hanoi's control by less forceful means, a new phase of the communist plan is ready to go into action. Open guerrilla warfare, furtive and remorseless, aimed at destroying the government and subjugating the people. It is called by Hanoi a war of liberation. It does not seem so to the hundreds of anti-communist leaders, teachers and their wives and children who are visited in the night by Viet Cong persuasion squads. This is the prize the communists are after. South Vietnam, rich in rice and standing at the gateway to the rice-rich nations of Cambodia. Laos, Thailand, Burma, and East Pakistan. And the Asian communists have said, a grain of rice is worth a drop of blood.
There are also natural resources. Coal, phosphate, zinc, tin, manganese. The raw materials on which to base industrialization or feed a war machine. Natural rubber. South Vietnam has this too. And the latex processing facilities which make of raw rubber the vitally important material it is in today's world. This then is another aspect of the South Vietnam which the North covets. A nation moving toward greater industrialization. A rich prize indeed in the eyes of communist strategists. At Gettysburg College in 1959, President Eisenhower clearly recognizes the danger. We have learned too that the cost of defending freedom of defending America must be paid in many forms and in many places. They are assessed in all parts of the world, in Berlin, in Vietnam, in the Middle East, here at home. Unassisted, Vietnam cannot, at this time, produce and support the military formations essential to it. Military, as well as economic help, is currently needed in Vietnam. By 1960, every area of life in the South has become a combat zone. This is a different kind of war. There are no marching armies or solemn declarations. But this is really war. It is guided by North Vietnam and it is spurred by Communist China. Its goal is to conquer the South and to extend the Asiatic dominion of communism. And there are great stakes in the balance. No people see this more clearly than the embattled, hard-pressed Vietnamese. By 1961, they send out an urgent call for help. The answer to that call is prompt in arriving. America promises substantial military and technical aid, machines and equipment to resist aggression, and the trained men to teach Vietnamese fighting forces how to put them into effective use. The American advisors are specialists, highly trained and motivated, often able to speak to trainees in their own language. Instructors and advisors willing and able to teach find men whose freedom is at stake, eager and quick to learn. At this time, however, the Americans in Vietnam are there only as advisors. There are no United States combat units as such. The advisors' primary job is to train and encourage the South Vietnamese fighting men they have come to respect and admire. This guerrilla warfare is the latest tactic in the global communist plan. Korea showed that the free world would meet and stop conventional invasion. And communists' efforts to dominate newly emerging nations through trade, aid, and political subversion had little success. Now a new kind of politically camouflaged invasion must be faced, the so-called People's War of Liberation. As months go by, the communists lose a lot of men. But there are many more in the North who will be sent south to replace them, and others can be kidnapped and forced to serve. Meantime, in addition to training Vietnamese fighting men, American advisor teams are working constantly to help relieve the human suffering of remote villages. Under pressure of growing communist aggression, the flow of American equipment and advisors is increased. It is the only means of meeting the rising tide of infiltration and attack from the north, especially since aggressive guerrillas with no citizenry to protect can tie up forces 10 times their own number.
Superior equipment and mobility are used to full advantage to carry the fight to the enemy, swiftly, wherever his presence becomes known. The Vietnamese soldier is quick to grasp the techniques involved in copter-borne counteraction to guerrilla raids on country villages, and he uses his new knowledge well. Even with superior equipment, however, this is a difficult war to prosecute. There are no front lines here. The war is everywhere against an enemy that is seldom clearly seen. In these scenes of casualty evacuation, the enemy is not far away, certainly within shouting distance. The enemy is not seen, but American and Vietnamese fighting men bear on their bodies the painful evidence that he is still here, still determined, still deadly. Throughout this time, the combat capability of South Vietnam's military forces is growing. American advisors work to bring the level of training and combat readiness of these forces as high as possible. But as North Vietnam continues to send in fresh cadres, there is a growing need in South Vietnam for fighting men. The losses suffered by the South in combat are cruelly heavy for a nation whose population is no larger than that of New York State. The fact is, in proportion to population, South Vietnam's losses in combat are 10 times as great as those suffered by the United States in Korea, greater even than our total losses in World War II. Then in August of 1964, the communists again enlarged the scope of the conflict. That reply is being given as I speak to you tonight. Air action is now in execution against certain supporting facilities in North Vietnam which have been used in these hostile operations. Never until now have American men and machines struck directly at communist North Vietnam. Later in August, Secretary of Defense McNamara sets the record straight. We wish to emphasize we seek no wider war. Our response will depend upon the action of the aggressors, in this case, the North Vietnamese. The key to the situation remains the cessation of infiltration from the North into the South. We seek no wider war, but we find ample evidence that there is no relenting on the part of the North. In this one captured shipment of Viet Cong arms, there are a million rounds of small arms ammunition, 3,500 rifles, submachine guns, and some 4,000 anti-tank and mortar rounds. And there's no doubt about the source. The Chinese markings are unmistakable. In meeting the aggression so clearly evidenced here, we have sent strength to meet force. But we have also repeatedly sent word that we are willing to talk, as Secretary of State Dean Rusk makes plain. Our war aim in South Vietnam is peace. President Johnson has directed me to do everything possible to bring this matter from the battlefield to the conference table. And so we've been utilizing all of the existing and available political machinery for that purpose. We've attempted to use the machinery of the Geneva Conferences of 1954 and 1962. Last year, we brought the Vietnam problem before the Security Council of the United Nations at the time of the Gulf of Tonkin affair. But Hanoi refused an invitation to come to the Security Council to talk about it. The distinguished Secretary General of the United Nations, U Tant, considered a peace mission himself to bring about peace, but Hanoi and Peiping told him not to come. Britain has made uh, many efforts to find a path to a settlement.
first by working toward a new conference in Geneva, and then by a visit of one of their senior statesmen, Mr. Patrick Gordon Walker. But the effort for a Geneva conference uh, has thus far been blocked, and Mr. Gordon Walker was told that he should stay away from Hanoi and Peiping. The Commonwealth attempted to send a committee of the Commonwealth to various capitals to explore the possibilities of peace. We welcome that initiative, but Hanoi and Peiping uh, told them uh, not to come. We made a number of efforts on our own, both publicly and privately. President Johnson at Baltimore, for example, offered unconditional discussion uh, with the government's concerned. But Hanoi and Peiping call this offer a hoax. Seventeen non-aligned nations publicly appealed for a peaceful solution by negotiations without preconditions. We welcome this proposal, but it was rejected by Hanoi and Peiping. The distinguished president of India made a constructive suggestion that there be an end of hostilities and an Afro-Asian police force established uh, in Vietnam. To us, uh, this proposal was full of interest and hope, but by Hanoi and Red China, it was rejected as a betrayal. So all of these abrupt and violent rejections of peaceful settlement are just what they appear to be. Clear proof that Hanoi is not yet prepared for discussions. Unless it be accepted in advance that South Vietnam be subjected to communist domination. And so the record seems very clear to us. Hanoi is presently resisting the road to peace. Peiping, even more so. The declared doctrine and purpose of the Chinese communists remain clear. The domination of all of Southeast Asia. And indeed, if we listen to what they're saying to us, the domination of the great world beyond. The United States will continue to make every effort toward reasonable negotiation, and there can be no doubt as to our intention. We do not seek the destruction of any government, nor do we covet a foot of any territory. But we insist, and we will always insist, that the people of South Vietnam shall have the right of choice, the right to shape their own destiny in free elections in the South or throughout all Vietnam under international supervision. And they shall not have any government imposed upon them by force and terror, so long as we can prevent it. We do not want an expanding struggle with consequences that no one can foresee, nor will we bluster or bully or flaunt our power, but we will not surrender, and we will not retreat. The answer to American offers to move from the battlefield to the conference table continues to come in the form of high explosives aimed at American air bases and other troop installations in the South, including the barracks of American servicemen. But in this war against people, the high explosives are not only aimed at men who bear arms. The American embassy in Saigon itself becomes a grim battleground scene as Viet Cong terrorists single it out for a bomb attack. It is all part of the carefully planned and continuing campaign of terror against both American and South Vietnamese civilians. Increasingly now, Americans are functioning directly in the fight for freedom in this far, foreign corner of the earth. The risks are real, just as the stakes for which they are taken are real. But Americans risk, and sometimes give, all that they have half a world away from home because they know that once again, half a world away has become our front door. 
If freedom is to survive in any American hometown, it must be preserved in such places as South Vietnam. And as President Johnson has pointed out, it is up to us. Most of the non-communist nations of Asia cannot by themselves and alone resist the growing might and the grasping ambition of Asian communism. Because this is true, and because we are a nation which honors its commitments and a people committed to our honor, we intend to convince the communists that we cannot be defeated by force of arms or by superior power. I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs to meet this mounting aggression. He has told me, and we will meet his needs. For the first time, combat units of the United States Marine Corps arrive in Vietnam, joining other Marines already there. It is the first time that Marines in full combat gear have hit the beach in an active combat zone since Korea. Army combat units also arrive, and the message of their presence on Vietnamese soil is plain. Whatever the present or future needs of the fight for freedom in Vietnam, they will be met. American forces in Vietnam know that the communists' so-called war of liberation is no less a form of aggression than was the conventional attack in Korea. And they know that this new form of aggression must be defeated and proven unprofitable, or the communists will be encouraged to try it elsewhere with greater confidence and resources. So the war goes on. Clearly, it is the communists who have made that choice. And as always, the innocent suffer. For the children of Vietnam and of all Southeast Asia, the future is in the balance. If they are to realize their heritage as free men tomorrow, there are for us today hard realities to be faced. I do not find it easy to send the flower of our youth, our finest young men, into battle. I have seen them in a thousand streets of a hundred towns in every state in this union, working and laughing and building and filled with hope and life. But as long as there are men who hate and destroy, we must have the courage to resist. We did not choose to be the guardians at the gate. But there is no one else. Nor would surrender in Vietnam bring peace, because we learned from Hitler at Munich that success only feeds the appetite of aggression. Moreover, we were in Vietnam to fulfill one of the most solemn pledges of the American nation. Three presidents, President Eisenhower, President Kennedy, and your present president, over 11 years have committed themselves and have promised to help defend this small and valiant nation. Strengthened by that promise, the people of South Vietnam have fought for many long years. Thousands of them have died. Thousands more have been crippled and scarred by war. And we just cannot now dishonor our word or abandon our commitment, or leave those who believed us and who trusted us to the terror and repression and murder that would follow. This then, my fellow Americans, 
is why we're in Vietnam. General Paul D. Hawkins, commander of the U.S. Military Assistance Command in Vietnam. Here today, the U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines are joined together in a common effort to help this country. Nowhere in the world today are we more aware of the inseparability of the problems of a people involved in fighting a war and building a nation than in Vietnam. For here is the rendezvous of all the historical forces in this century. The communists have long sought a takeover in Vietnam, and the first phase of struggle after World War II resulted in the North-South Petition directly reflecting our divided world. Now, this young nation remaining on freedom's side is engaged in a war which is as hidden and stealthy as it is relentless and exhausting. Responding to the request of the Republic of Vietnam, the United States has come to help, as we have helped and are helping all free people who seek to defend themselves from the communist scourge. The U.S. effort to our Vietnamese allies is a vast and comprehensive one. It involves political, economic, psychological, and military measures. All of the armed forces of the U.S. play a part. Because our efforts here are so comprehensive, the whole story cannot be told in 30 minutes. Today, our focus is on the U.S. Army Special Forces, one important part of our overall effort. I'm James Arnes. During the next 30 minutes, you're going to meet a remarkable group of Americans. Members of the United States Army's Special Forces on duty in South Vietnam. The Republic of Vietnam, on the eastern edge of the Indochina Peninsula, is about as far from home as an American can be while still on Earth. When it's 7 o'clock in the morning here in Saigon, it's 7 o'clock the previous night in New York City. Army Special Forces were sent to Vietnam because they're experts specialists in training men to fight a special kind of war. It's a dirty war, fought without uniforms on a battlefield without boundaries. A war where the friendly farmer you pass in a rice paddy may become the murderous enemy the instant the sun goes down. Sunset is beautiful in South Vietnam, but then night comes, and at night in Vietnam, men die. The communist guerrilla lives off the people, by persuasion if possible, but if propaganda fails, by terror. Fear and propaganda have turned the isolated villages of Southeast Asia into a theater of war, a war which can only be won or lost by the villagers themselves. What Americans can do is combat fear by giving them guns and the training they need to defend themselves against terrorism. And we can reply to the propaganda by actions. We can bring to these remote areas some tangible proof that the way of life we propose is a good life, worth fighting for. This is the story of a small group of Americans who are quietly trying to do that job, now in the swamps and jungles of Vietnam. different labels. 
But one thing they all have in common, the innocent suffer. The guerrilla warfare being conducted against the Republic of Vietnam by the Vietnamese communists, the Viet Cong, isn't new. We saw it with minor variations in China, in Malaya, in Greece, in the Philippines, in Cuba, in Laos. It's a kind of war which recognizes no non-combatants. In Vietnam, the communist guerrillas promise progress, yet their favorite targets for assassination are school teachers, doctors, engineers, anyone trying to do today what they promise for tomorrow. Life will be lived on their terms or not at all. What happens to Vietnam will depend in the end on who wins the villages. And the government of the United States has determined that it won't be communist guerrillas. This is Major General William B. Rawson. He was then a brigadier on a recent visit to a strategic village high in the mountains of central Vietnam. As special assistant to the chief of staff for special warfare, he has come to inspect the village defense system, established here by a 12-man special forces team, a handful of Americans who in a few short months have converted a remote, guerrilla-infested highland plateau into a major training center of anti-communist tribesmen. We asked General Rawson to describe the war in Vietnam and the role of the Special Forces soldier. There are many terms which might be used to characterize the conflict now occurring in Vietnam. For the general public, the best known probably is guerrilla warfare. However we refer to it, there can be no question that armed insurgency on a large scale is taking place aimed at the destruction of a people's national independence. It is the policy of the United States government to advise and assist the people of the Republic of Vietnam in their struggle to defeat the communist insurgency which strives to eradicate their freedom. The American soldiers you will see in this film are part of our assistance effort. As members of the U.S. Army's Special Forces, they are among the most highly trained military personnel the world has known. Each of them has been trained in a variety of skills which in more conventional organizations would be distributed among two or more individuals. These soldiers possess the capability of going to remote, primitive regions of the world to live with the people, eat their food or share their lack of it, learn their language, their customs and taboos, and win their confidence and respect. The future of such areas of Southeast Asia ultimately may be determined by events taking place in remote jungle villages which appear on no maps, by acts of violence occurring only under the cover of darkness, by wars which can be won or lost before the world is aware that a war has even begun. This film documents a small part of what the armed forces, and particularly your army, is doing to assure that such conflicts wherever they may be forced upon us, can be resisted successfully by ourselves and our allies. I'm Captain Ron Shackleton, detachment commander of the Special Forces personnel in this area. American advisors first began laying the groundwork for village defense in this region in September 1961. At that time, the villagers in this area were almost completely defenseless against the predatory tactics of the Viet Cong, the Vietnamese communists. Out of fear, these mountain people were forced to both feed and house roving Viet Cong patrols, and their young men were often forced into Viet Cong activities in order to protect the lives of their families. Our effort during the months we have been here have been to teach the mountaineers who call themselves the Rade people that they are capable of defending themselves against such tactics, that they need not be afraid. We have shown the Rade how to build stockade type fences and how to maintain 24 hour security.
This is Master Sergeant John Slover, who has just returned from observing a patrol. Through an interpreter, he will comment on his observations. Uh, there's just one point I want to stress. Some carry their weapon down like this. Carry their weapon out the ready at all times. Where their eyes are, so is the muzzle of their weapon. Not all our advisors rely on interpreters. Here we see Sergeant Bill Belch instructing the carbine in fluent Vietnamese. They like Ho Sun Carabin, La Ka Bamre, Chuk Ki, Hau Lap Va Tao, Ho Sun Nai, Toi Sa Nai Qua Vay Nhung Tin Kai Kua Ho Sun Nai, Muon Ban Chet Mo Ten Quan Di, Kai Ka Gai Ko La Chung Va Chom Tuc Thi Duoc Voi Ho Sun Nai, Nhung Sa Han Thi Chac La Khong Duoc, Nhung Ma Thong Thong Chang Nhung Khu Vuoc Như Thay Nai Như La Zung Hay La Co Nhieu Ke. Thì thường thường không trông thấy sao được Thế thì nếu một tên con địch gần Basic instruction in the care and use of a weapon Familiar to any veteran of the U.S. Army In this class, one of our raw day instructors Is teaching his men a technique in search and seizure For arresting Viet Cong agents Many such agents conceal themselves in friendly villages disguised as ordinary workmen. These men are from surrounding villages. They have come to our village seeking training which will enable them to provide their own defense against guerrilla bands. It is not unusual to see 200 or more of these people each week. Outside the village gate is a sign which says, Here, no Viet Cong need apply for rice or any other assistance, that this is a free village which is no longer afraid. We have taught our friends small unit tactics and given them modern equipment with which to defend themselves. People who once defended their freedom with a crossbow are now learning to use rifles, submachine guns, and grenades. Bajong! Bajong! Ma patangan! Ma! And up and up! No! Hey, back! Back! Today, these Rade people, who are in some ways very primitive by American standards, are among the best anti-guerrilla fighters in Southeast Asia. As our program expands, new special forces teams are moving into other villages, always with the same goal to teach people who value their independence how to preserve it. Okay, Odie, your boys have got all your equipment. You're all set to go just about now, aren't you? Just about. Okay, fine. Well, you know that we're going to have trouble to the south. When we first set the circle up up here, uh, VC didn't know what we are doing. And it took them about a month to really figure out just what we're about to do there. So uh, when we move to the south, they already know just about what we're going to do. And once we start building up the same defensive systems we had up here, they're going to try and hit us as soon as we start. So we're going to have to watch that. Well, already for the past couple of weeks, you and your team have been here observing my team work with the Rod Day people in village defense. You've been exposed to some of our training problems, our logistical problems, and some of the problems that arise from working through interpreters. If there are any questions that you or your team have at this time or any other way that we can help you, please feel free to ask.
Thank you, Ron. Uh, the last two weeks have been very beneficial as far as we, our team is concerned. We've learned a lot, as of course you mentioned, the interrogation and so forth, and the uh, training with the raw day working through interpreters. The one point that you can help us with, though, is on this field headquarters there you've got set up. Uh, where we're going, we'll probably be working decentralized training rather than centralized and the results you have may help us down there. But uh, when we go to the other area, I'm afraid that we're going to have a few more problems down there that we don't have here. For example, a different tribe, and plus we're working with two different types of group of people, Zip and the male tribe. And we can take what you have given us here and then modify it to meet the situation down there. As far as equipment-wise, I think we pretty well got everything you had. Uh, how about uh, lesson plans and uh, training schedules there? Uh, we're okay on that, but we'll probably have to make some changes as our situation goes along. Okay, Van, how about the combo situation? Uh, it's pretty well in hand? Well, we'll try the same system they're using here. If that don't work, we'll change it. The villages of Southeast Asia were old in the days of Julius Caesar. Throughout their long history, they have been regularly conquered, oppressed, liberated, and invaded again. In the best of times, lives here are neither long nor easy. Maybe it's not surprising that the villagers of Vietnam have simple ideas about what makes a friend. Friends are people who help. Medics of a rather special kind are part of a special forces team to care for their own men. But in isolated, often disease-ridden hamlets where no doctor has ever gone, a special forces medic with his extensive specialized training may be the only contact with modern medicine the people will ever have. Okay, uh, I'll give you this script here, I'm down to medicine and she can pick it up. The use of military personnel to win friends as well as to fight is gaining ground in Vietnam. A villager is likely to be more interested in a new roof for his house than in the outcome of the Cold War or the threat of communism. The training and advising of Vietnamese civic action teams for work in the villages of Vietnam may be one of our major contributions to the defeat of communism in Southeast Asia. But if good works are an answer to communist propaganda, they're not enough to repel the guerrilla terrorism which invariably follows when propaganda fails. This is the village of Huc Thien, near the coast of the South China Sea. By refusing food and volunteers to Viet Minh guerrillas, these villagers subject themselves to 250 guerrilla attacks in five years. That's an average of one a week. They're about to show an American visitor how they survived. A typical alert, which here is more often real than practice. organized into a small fort. When the alert sounds, every man, woman, and child has either a place to hide or a post to defend. They've defended it so well that guerrilla attacks have virtually ceased. The price of extorting food and supplies has become too big for the guerrillas to pay. And it's worth remembering that they did this all on their own. Americans are now giving them weapons and technical advice. But in this case, we're only making a good thing better, and maybe making life a little easier for a town full of brave people. from behind a stockade fence. Sooner or later, you have to take the fight to the enemy, whether he's an army or only a band of guerrillas prowling the surrounding jungle. At a special forces training camp outside Saigon, volunteers from the village of Huc Thien are training to carry their war outside the gates. These training missions can be interesting. The jungle is never safe. 
when you practice searching for gorillas hiding in jungle villages, you're always liable to find some. In this school, nobody has trouble keeping the students awake. A moment's carelessness can lead to disaster. You don't cross a clearing, pass a temple, or walk through a cemetery without making sure. Natives of the Vietnamese highlands have nothing to learn from Americans about jungle living. But they do need help in mastering the tactics and using the modern weapons which communist trained guerrillas are using against them. Like mountain people everywhere, they are natural soldiers who learn fast. These are men of the Nung Chinese, training at a special forces camp near the town of Da Nang. They are already some of the most experienced anti-guerrilla fighters in Southeast Asia. In 1954, 25 of these same men turned back an assault by 1,000 Viet Minh soldiers, killing 600 in the process. These are mountain people of the Katang tribe. They and their U.S. instructors are drawing rations of dried shrimp and rice for a week-long jungle patrol. A joint training exercise with soldiers of the regular Vietnamese army, it will have the added practical advantage of making life difficult for a battalion of Viet Cong guerrillas who happen to be using the same jungle. The main problem in taking the fight to the guerrillas in Vietnam or anywhere else in Southeast Asia is terrain. Ordinary means of travel are too slow to counter the hit and run tactics of communist guerrillas. One answer to that problem is the helicopter. Helicopters manned by pilots trained to fly at treetop level can bring troops into a guerrilla-occupied area the moment their presence becomes known. The helicopter also increases the staying power of the anti-guerrilla patrols. With fresh supplies of food and medicine available in the heart of the jungle itself, patrols like these can cover a lot of territory, stay until they find what they came for. The communist guerrilla is beginning to learn that there are fewer places to hide in the jungles of Vietnam. Some of the Viet Cong guerrillas are hardcore communists, prepared to die for a cause in which, unfortunately, they sincerely believe. The Viet 
Kong also includes men, many of them, who only want an alternative. Men like this young Rade tribesman, who a few days ago deserted the guerrillas and came to a special forces team seeking protection. His name is Trung, 22 years old. How long has he been with the VC? Damlan a dog from Viet Minh. Dog Viet Minh, Damlan, Nan Sa, Nan Tua. He has been with the VC two months since January. Why did he join the VC? Sing out like a dog from Viet Minh. When dog Viet Minh, he does it in Mac Ho, Go, the Kumanao in Ye. He joined VC because VC forced him, pressed him to go in jungle. Why did he desert the VC? Nhưng ngạc lại cái lạc đội mà Việt Cộng. Có cái lạc đội mà Việt Cộng, người ta có một đôi kia rồi, một lại cái nạp nhảy. Đi chữ trang, quỳ bàn quẹ. He desert VC because he does not like the life of VC. And he threat badly many people still right and work hard. Uh, why did he come to our specific training area? Thế ngại chẳng khởi cái bộ này nào này. Có rẻ bộ nào này, người ta có một hình. He come here because he know that program in Burning Now is for Rade people and for Rade benefit and he went to work here to help Rade people to have better life. How large was the group of VC that he was with? Dom Chau Pong Viet Minh Bet Hong Eh. Viet Minh Dok Bet Kau Pa Plu Chau. 40 people with him. It will be a long while in Vietnam before any swords are beaten into plowshares. But the time will come. What the people want is peace. Peace and a chance for a better life. The communist Viet Cong promises them progress. But in the meantime, creates a world where peaceful citizens must go armed in fear of their lives. What the Viet Cong guerrilla really wants is power. What he can't control, he tries to destroy. In South Vietnam, the old promises don't work as well as they used to. And so the guerrilla resorts more and more to terrorism. Is at war with his own people. The Vietnamese are an ancient race and an independent one. This is not the first time they've fought for the right to decide their own destiny. For 2,000 years, they've defended that right against all the emperors of China, against the cavalry of Kublai Khan, against modern armies using machine guns and airplanes. Given time, they will send today's would-be oppressors to join the others in defeat. Our purpose in Vietnam is to give them that time. <laughs>